Hello, everybody, and welcome to Decisions Daily Lunch and Learn. Um, apologies for the late start today. We had some technical difficulties, and uh, we appreciate you hanging in there while we uh, got this thing started. Um, my name is Matt. I'm going to be hosting today. And um, if this is new to you, uh, the way you can ask questions is either through raising your hand in the uh, through Zoom or posting a question in the Zoom chat or the question and answer box. Um, if you've got questions, feel free to post them in the chat raise your hand and I will uh, unmute you and you can um, we can get your uh, questions answered. So first I'm seeing a chat come in from Joshua and the question is is there a way to add a directory via a flow? I see the step but I can't seem to get the folder to appear. I also would like to like it to go in a certain location. Um, the answer is yes, and I, I, I'm assuming here that you're asking about uh, adding a, a like a folder, like a folder in the folder tree using a flow. Um, Josh, I want to allow you to talk. You can unmute and you can confirm that. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, how's it going? Good. So yeah, you're talking about basically creating a like a subfolder. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I just need this. This is kind of a continuation of my question from uh, last week. I just want to be able to store these files I'm getting back via API uh, in a separate folder for each month. So I want to create each month, I need to um, create a new folder and then put all the files inside that folder and they should all go in a certain place in the files in the folder structure. Uh, folder all right. That sounds good. Let's, uh, I'm just going to create a flow and we're going to go ahead and uh, I'll show you how to create a directory. Yeah, then I, I I would get I need to get the the ID of that directory back in the flow, I guess, so I can move stuff into it. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. We should be able to do that. Um, so you know, just, just like most things, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, let me. Uh, so on, I want to find the most. Called, on six is called create directory, I think. Oh, I see. And are you trying to create a directory on like your app server, or are you trying to create a decisions folder? A decisions folder. Aha. Okay, so you might be looking at a step that's intended to create a directory on the actual app server, ah. which would explain potentially why you're not seeing that show up. Um, exactly. If you're looking yeah. to create a subfolder, that'd be this okay. step. So um, when I do, hold on, okay, so let me see, in six, when I do that, it gives me, one second, it looks like it's, it creates, oh, maybe it's, one second, um, okay, I yeah, keep on going, because I, I, it looks like when I use that step, it's something for like Amazon Web Services or something, and not for, decisions but here I'll, I'll check in a second you can keep on going in the meantime yeah um and you you have a step called create subfolder that it looks like it's intended for aws yeah there might be two steps with the same name and the one you'd want to look for would be the uh well if you drag it out um okay. if you look at the class name that'd be an easy way to identify that it's the right okay. one with it being decisions framework um Okay. You know, I could be pretty certain it's going to create a subfolder. Yeah. If if you search that and in six it's not showing up in the uh, in the toolbox just with a simple search, um, let me know because I I could show you another way to find that step. So right when I do oh, this is it create new folder name parent folder ID okay so it looks like I have I have it here okay so yeah if you can still show it show it that would be helpful. That I know I'm doing it right. Um, yeah, you want me to run this step and, and take a look yeah. at what happens? Yeah. No problem. So let's uh, just call this new folder. And for the parent folder ID, we just want to give it the value of some, you know, some place. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it the folder that I'm currently in. So lunch and learn. 
And I'm going to debug it just so we can watch it actually execute. And the output here, it's called output, but this is the new folder ID. And I think that's what <laughs> you said you would need in your flow. Back in this folder, uh, I should see a new folder called, I think I called it just new folder. And here it is. It's just a regular default folder type. Okay. And Perfect. pretty straightforward there. You should be able to put whatever else you want in there, just like a regular folder. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, I've got another question coming in um, through the chat. Looks like this was the next one. I need, this is from Reina. I need to create and register login APIs and access through mobile app. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you so you can uh, elaborate on that question. Uh, Reina, would you mind giving me the uh, the details of what you're asking for here? Give me one moment. I think uh, I need to allow you to talk, although it doesn't seem to be working. Are you able to hear me? Could you you could use the chat to uh oh, I heard uh something for a second there. I mean you should be able to unmute at this point. I think I've I think I've got it. Zoom was just a little delayed. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, so I want to ask uh, how I can uh create register and login APIs through decisions so I can access them through mobile app. And when you say a login API, what do you what do you mean by that? I mean, I want to use decisions at my, as my backend and uh, mobile app as, a, as front end. Oh. And are you talking about uh, decisions mobile app? Or you uh, no. want to make custom, like I want to use APIs from decision, like all the brain um, database, database structures, everything, and uh, views uh, should be on native Xcode and uh, Android Studio. Gotcha. Okay, so do you want your users to have actual decisions accounts and be able to authenticate using those? Yeah. Okay, um, so those features that you'd be looking for would um, those would be all accessible and readable through if you go to system and then administration, click on features and then all services. Mm -hmm. In here, um, this is listing out all of the services that are accessible in decisions. Um, to log someone in, you would use the account service. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you want to get information on that, you click account service, and then I'm going to click on view integration details. On this page, you know, it lists out all of the different methods that this service has. So, um, you know, for example, change password, add new account, and there should be something for login or authenticate. Uh, but this is where you're going to be able to find that information for those. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I don't need to make them. They're actually already there, right? Yeah, for the most part, um, if you're looking for a service that is, you know, something that you would expect to exist out of the box, it probably does, and it would be in here. Um, for things that you can't find in here, you could always build a flow and then use that flow as an integration, as an API with your app. But, you know, for example, yeah, yeah. logging in, this information would be right here. You can configure it to how you want to uh, actually access this and the information, you know, how to the documentation essentially on how to use it would be on the right hand side here. Mm -hmm. Can you show me register API account creation API? Uh, yeah, so that would be, I think there was one called 
create account or something. It wasn't create. Add new account. Is that what you're looking for? OK, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yep. So this one, um, you know, it's just looking for all the account information. Um, but yeah, no, you don't you won't have to create this. This will exist out of the box um, and you can find them all, like I said, in the uh, features folder. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. OK, next question is coming in through the question and answer box, and this is from Jackie. Uh, I have three projects that depend on a main project. The main project starts the flow and directs which project slash flow to run and populates the request type dropdown for the other three projects. Currently, I have the projects nested within the main project as projects. What benefits are there to using the project slash sub project functionality instead of nested projects other than structuring the folder hierarchy of projects on the repository? Couldn't find any documentation. You're just looking through the FAQs. Um, good question, Jackie. Uh, I'm gonna allow you to unmute too if you'd like. Um, but as far as I'm aware, and this, you know, this may not be the, the full truth here, but I think it's mostly intended for organizing those folders on the repository itself. I haven't seen um any other functionality that comes with creating a sub project other than in the repository those folders will be organized you know, in the way that you've dictated right so um if you're if they're nested already is there any point in making the sub project because the repo looks like it's nested with those projects mm -hmm. Um, well, I think the point would be to have it nested on the repository. So that way on the repository, the very clear, you know, these sub projects are, well, sub projects of some parent. Um, okay. and I, is there some specific functionality that you would be looking for there or like hoping to see? Uh, no, no, I'm just trying to, because, because I've, um, so I, I've got a ticket in, I've been speaking back and forth with Ashley and my projects all have the same name. And so I want to split them up and put them, give them different project names. And then she said, oh, well, there's something called sub project, um, mm -hmm. you know, have a read of this. So I started looking into it and then I, I wondered, um, you know, is there, because I have to you know, rename the projects that, and they're all in different environments. So, you know, one's in production even. And so I thought, well, at the same time I'm renaming those, let's have a look at this. And that's really uh, why I started looking at it. Um, so it's it's not necessary I do it, but you know, if that's, if that's kind of best practice, I would like to do it that way while I'm reorganizing everything. Um, yeah. And and so I, I went, I actually created a sub project. Um, but when I created that sub project, it created a second project, which was my main project name. Um, and so I don't know how that's going to work when I already I'm using that project name and whether the repository is going to know that's the same project, right? I, I don't even know if it's going to work correctly. And so I didn't know what to expect to see. So I thought if, I don't know if you could go in there and just do a quick creating to show me how it's supposed to look. Um, I, I just, I don't want to break anything that's already there. Like there's some other developers doing stuff in here as well. So um, I wasn't expecting it to see uh, when I created the sub project in the repository, uh, the designer repository, which is where it said to create it, I wasn't expecting it to, to see it creating to, um, you know, the main and the sub project. And then when I went in to actually add uh, one of my projects to that sub project, it wasn't in the, uh, the list of projects uh, for me to add it to. So oh, I see. I, okay, so when you went so to my, add, your sorry, sub project sorry. wasn't in the list, right? So I'm that, not. Uh, I'm not. 
yeah, I, I'm not knowing what I'm supposed to be seeing here because I couldn't find any documentation that walked me through the process. And that's kind of my question. If, if I created a subproject in the designer repository, why wouldn't I see it in the list um, to add my project to? Um, you actually created it in the repository first. You didn't actually go to like your dev server and create the project no, there? It was my dev, dev server. I went to my dev server and it told me to go to designer uh, designer uh, repository, uh, I guess in system. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, system designer, designers, and then designer repository. And so it told me, yeah, so it said to create it here. So I created the sub project um, and, and it's the main project dot sub project. And that's how you create it. And when I did that, it created two projects. <clears throat> so if, if, you, if you create a project here and you put, I don't know, project and then dot sub project, which are the project names um, for an example, <clears throat> it created two separate things here. Created one called project and one set, well, not actually called project, but you know, whatever one, you had. In yes. The yeah, so one called project and one called project.subproject. Gotcha. Um, to me, that makes sense because in order to have the subproject, you'd have to have this one. But are you but, saying it duplicated the project name? So you'd see this name twice when you are like attempting to add some element to a project? No, um, but because I already have my main project, and it's already in use and it's already has things in it. I wasn't expecting it to see it creating it a second time um, in here. Just in this designer repository folder? Yes. I see, okay, so let and me create a project. I'm just gonna call it project. Yeah. yeah. I don't really need a URL. Um, but why don't you just can you create a project dot like a sub project instead to see so you can see what I'm actually seeing? Yeah. Yeah, and this is what you mean. Create yes. it like this. I'll expect yeah. it to create a project called project and then a project called sub project. Right. And I didn't put a URL and you can put a description. You don't have to put a URL. You can just put a description. And so that's the way I did it. Yeah, I'm gonna take that out. <clears throat> ah, okay, well, thanks for that, I didn't realize. Yeah. Okay, hitting create. Yeah, so it created this project and then it created the sub project. Okay, so um, that's- And that's... on your server, you're seeing a project with, you're seeing two projects with the same name. Correct. No, no, I'm seeing what you're seeing. It's, it's, that's exactly what I saw. That's what exactly what I happened. Um, but uh, my question is because I already have one called in this particular scenario, I already had one called project. So now if I have a project here and I'm already got a project using a project, will those connect or do I have to remove everything I have in that main project? and add them back in. I am not 100% sure, but I'm fairly certain that the project that you created that showed up here would be the same as the one that was already existing. And the reason I think that is because you can only have one project on a server of a certain name. And so, most likely it's going to associate, you know, this new project that you created through here with the existing one on that server. Um, I do want to say I'm not 100% sure of that. Yeah, and I don't I don't think it has because my R number or but I guess the repository numbers um, are are just a new record, right? So this, all right. Yeah, this would just be the revision name, but I wonder. Right. Um would it be possible what you could do is uh, just associate some like one new flow to that project, to this new project that was created here 
and sync just that one new flow to the repository and you could then look and see where that appeared right. and can confirm before syncing anything else. Okay. And now, um, because I haven't checked in uh, anything using, like you've just created these, so they won't exist already in the repository. And that's why I wouldn't actually see the sub project in the repository because I haven't checked it in yet. Is that exactly. correct? Yeah, these okay. wouldn't show up in, in until the first sync. Okay. At this point, you know, like this server, this my local server, which is what I'm on right here, isn't connected to any repository. But if it were, these wouldn't show up until I actually moved, you know, deployed something to that repository from here. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also I'm going to submit a doc request to get more information on sub projects because I think we need that. You know, we got to have more information on how they're expected to work and what, what the point is there. By the way, I do think that it is best practice if you've got these projects that are related to go and use sub projects, even if it is just for the repository organization, I would still recommend doing that. Yeah, yeah, which is what my thought was. I just wanna make sure that it's not gonna break everything. You know, I'm still quite new. So, you know, I'm just hesitant to do anything that I really haven't done before and like doing it on my own without any direction. Um, yeah. doesn't feel all nice and warm and fuzzy, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. I yeah. That's why, you know, I'd recommend doing the single flow. There's a lot less that could go wrong there. I mean, you can always remove that flow. Right. And know before you sink the rest. Yes. All right. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay. I You know, I have another question. In the question and answer, this one is marked as answered, but I haven't actually answered it yet. This question is from Dan. Uh, the question is, are we able to use MySQL or Postgres SQL running on AWS RDS as a decisions core database server? I'd rather not use Microsoft SQL. Um, the uh, MySQL, no. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think at this point that could be the database that Decisions is running on. Um, I do believe that Postgres is something that is intended to be supported in the future. I don't know that that is fully supported as of right now, but that is on the roadmap. Um, um, actually, this, uh, Postgres is supported currently. I'm not sure how it is with AWS on my personal stuff, but I have it running for my local host. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you, Amber. So it is actually supported right now fully. The Postgres. Are you on? Are you using version seven? Yeah, I'm, I'm using the latest version seven. I don't. It's not supported in later versions like version six, but it is with version seven. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so version seven, yes, uh, Postgres is supported at this point. So uh, I don't think it would matter if it's running on AWS. I want to say that that you know is is that shouldn't make any difference. Are you? Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, hey, Dan, I can. Hey, hey there. Yeah, um, I, I think it runs as localhost, but I don't know if there's any way to authenticate on a separate uh, Amazon server with Postgres and uh, the instructions I was getting from the tickets weren't really clear. So I was like kind of struggling trying to get the setup working. Um, I'd rather have like a, you know, Amazon RDS has you know, pretty optimized database servers. So I was hoping to use that, but Microsoft SQL is really expensive to run on RDS, um, but I just can't seem to get clear instructions on authenticating against that PostgreSQL database. I see. And it sounds like you've already got a ticket open yeah, that they're just, question. yeah, I just don't know if anybody on your team really knows the clear answer to this. Like, they were kind of they showed some authentication method for authenticating against Microsoft Microsoft SQL, and they said this may work for Postgre, but you know, Postgres, but uh, was not very clear. So it's just, uh, but it sounds like you're probably in the same boat. Just uh, not 100 clear how this setup would work. Yeah, that's correct. I I am in the same boat as in this is not my area of expertise, and I wouldn't want to steer you wrong. Um, let me, I can go and find that ticket and see if we can get a, you know, more straightforward answer to that. Okay. I right, will appreciate that. 
Um, and it looks like you had another question too in regards to truth table. Yeah, um, so I'm pretty new to decisions, just getting this set up for the first time. I ran through a pilot with another developer and that's why I'm kind of familiar with this concept, but we're um, basically trying to match records in a database to a truth table. Um, so there's, you know, uh, it's going row by row and determining whether it, you know, it's a pass or fail, um, you know, standard truth table. But I'm wondering, can you actually determine if if there's a direct match to like five of the rows in that truth table? Can you actually get that information out to know not only, not only did it pass, but that it actually matched against five of these records in your truth table? Um, I think that that is something we can do. Let me double check that by, I'm gonna go ahead and create a truth table. And then I'm gonna put it in a flow. I think there's a setting on the step in the flow to output, you know, mm, true rows, yeah. Um, but I want to, I haven't done that recently, so I want to actually go through and look at what that, in fact, does look like here. I don't really need this actually to do a whole lot. All right, so I've got a random truth table set up that's not actually gonna do anything, um, but I should be able to look at the settings of this step. inputs. I'm not seeing it, but I think it might be because my truth table is not set up to output. It's only outputting a Boolean and I've only got a single row. So let me add a few more because sometimes mm -hmm. the way these truth tables are set up um, does impact how the step properties look. So I'll go ahead and add one for the second input. Oh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I need to add a column. this one. Okay, let's see if that changed anything now that I can um, have multiple rows come back. Okay, let me change the output. So is your, your truth table, is it outputting just a, like a true or false or probably outputting something more like a... Yeah, it was a pass or fail. So we're going through a bunch, we're trying to compare um, whether a product is quote sustainable or matches certain criteria. So we're checking several fields. And if there's a match, then we just say it passed. And so we actually just realized, oh, it could actually pass multiple rows. Is there any way to, to check that? I want to see like what specifically caused this one to pass. Yeah. Okay. Um, that so it is actually, actually if, it's outputting yeah. a Boolean then. Um, 
yeah, pass fail, but yeah, to be able to know actually which, you know, which uh, of those ID, which rows it passed. Gotcha. You're looking around here for a moment because I'm not immediately seeing what I was expecting to see. Oh. Okay, so I can see that that output true, which is what I would have expected, but I can't see the row. I mean, obviously in the debugger I can, but you want this to output information about the row that was mm -hmm. evaluated as true. Let me try one other thing. So I'm going to change this from a Boolean to a, a string as the output. And then I want to see if that has any kind of impact on, yeah. So first of all, because now it's not outputting just a true or false path, it's outputting done. Um, and then it's going to output the result. But you could have more than one result, given that you know if your truth table executes true in multiple rows. In this case, though, you could get an actual ID of like the row that passed. You had a field in there that had some kind of row ID or something if you wanted to store like uh, IDs associated with each row. That would be one way to do it. I mean, you could, yeah, you can output that row's ID. What I'm, what I'm looking for specifically is the option to output multiple rows. Because right now, obviously, you know, it's, it's returning just one result. It just reality, like passes and then it just drops out of the, the flow. Is that kind of how it works? Or? That's how it's working now. But I'm expecting to be able to see. Um, I mean, let me just have another output data. Because, OK, so there should be some way to see which rows are outputting like you, you could expect multiple results from this truth table the way it's set up now i'm trying to remember how to get this option Let me check on the document site real quick. Using multiple data return truth tables. That's what I'm looking uh. for. All right, truth table, uh, name, you know, name it, whatever. Trying to think. There's got to be something that is set up here that allows it to output multiple. OK, I've done all this. This is all the same as what I did. Default output data, click the pencil. Um, they just named it KenRent. They're adding another output. Uh, 
I'm trying to see specifically in here what might be different. Now that the applicant's parameters for possible age range are sent, debug the flow. Oh, this means multiple data returners and there's multiple columns coming out of that truth table. Which again, you know, you like you said, you could give it some sort of identifier, but you're expecting to get a list of results back. Or, well, actually, I should ask you that. Are you expecting a list of results back? Like in, in your well, truth table, the way I it's mean, set we, up could... We could theoretically set it up so it only gives one positive, but I'm just wondering, I just want to figure out my, my infrastructure if I want to set this up so that it could pass two and I get two variables coming out, like it passed this row and this row, or if I absolutely need to design it. Yeah, so it's separate truth tables. You know, that there can only be one possible match, and then I do need to get like the, you know, the out some output criteria ideally be like unique to that row. So like a, a an ID to know what, what exactly passed. I guess it's kind of like similar to saying what age range are you, and it's like oh this. I mean that's kind of simple, but um, like could it say this is both a safe driver and in the right age group and in this, you know, like meets several criteria that always have to be separate truth tables for each very specific request or match. Uh, you know, well, in this example from the documentation, the approach that they're taking is you can check all of those with the single truth table, um, but your outputs would be uh, what would determine like, you know, those multiple different variables that you're looking for. So in this case, they're outputting can rent is young driver and cost per day from the input. And you could then, uh, you could have multiple criteria or multiple rules in these you know, evaluation columns as well. Is that just corresponding to one row that matched that one true green row is just one, that's one row in the truth table that matched all of those criteria? Yeah, I guess the way this is set up, I see what you're saying. This would actually be, you'd have to set this up in a way that you know only one row would evaluate true. Right, okay. That's and then you get all the results for that specific. It wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have to do multiple truth tables, although that would also work. Because mm -hmm. you could have one truth table in this example for can't rent, another one for a young driver, and then so on and right, so forth. Right. Uh, or you could set up in the same truth table, but you'd have to go through and make sure logically that only one rule or one row is going to evaluate to true um, in our case we have multiple inputs so we're like there's many different combinations that could theoretically match so we just have to decide if we're going to structure it in a way that there's only one possible match so i was looking on the documentation site and that might be a gap we currently have just on the site itself but i found a forum post that might help you matt with what you're trying to do i can post it in the chat so anyone can view um excellent yes please i believe that might be applicable and if not, then we can certainly fix it so we can get that gap covered. <laughs> All right, yeah, so this is on our forum site. I'm trying to create a truth table that I evaluate data passed from a form and return two values. Okay, great. Hopefully this will have what I'm missing. <laughs> is what I'm looking for. Only return first result, and then you'd be able to uncheck it. This is this is very similar to what I was at least looking for, but I'm trying to figure out why I don't have this option. Like I said, I think it has to do with the way that I configured my truth table. But I'm not sure, uh, that's strange. This is what you would be looking for, though, right? Because then you can uncheck return right. only first result. And any row that returns true should be output from the truth table. Now, it's going to output the result field. So in your case, you know, you'd have a bunch of Booleans that were true. Right. But as you said, you know, you could add another um, that an ID and have multiple output. IDs come out. Okay. Exactly. And then you'd be able to know, like, this ID corresponds to this row returning true. 
Okay, sounds good. I'll explore a little further on my own and uh, see if I can figure this out. Excellent. Yeah, go ahead and see if you can find that button. I, it's strange. I mean, maybe, it, like I said, I think it has to do with the way that I set up my truth table, but I'm not seeing the return multiple rows or results checkbox. It'd be somewhere right here in this properties panel. Could be a difference between version six and seven. It looks like this screenshot is in version six, I believe, just based yes. off of the property panel being on the left. I was going to say the form post itself is a little old, so we might that might be something for a doc ticket itself is just updating this so we can have that on our seven documentation, have that more available. Gotcha. I appreciate that, yeah. Amber. Oh, no problem. Thanks for finding this gap. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem, Dan. Sorry we weren't able to, you know, completely answer that, but um, appreciate you uh, asking and at least we've got part of the way to the solution and a better, uh, you know, idea for what we can enhance our doc site with. Right, sounds good. Um, look through the chat. I don't see any other open questions or hands raised. If you've got another question, this is a good chance to ask it. Um, otherwise, I believe we are going to wrap this up. I'm going to give just a few seconds here in case there's any last questions that want to come through. but I don't think that there are. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, as always, if you are looking for a recording of one of these Lunch and Learns, you can find them on YouTube, um, as well as all the historical Lunch and Learns. Um, I hope everybody has a good rest of their week. Uh, I'll see you again on another Lunch and Learn. Bye everybody.